How is set UID implemented? So what do we think happens inside set UID? First of all, where is it implemented? That call that set UID inside Apache, inside HTTPD. Where is that going? Okay. Um, eventually. Is it going right to kernel space? Are we calling directly into the kernel? So what, what would it mean if we could call directly into the kernel? If, as a user level program, you could do a normal function call and get into the kernel? That would be pretty scary. It would mean one of two things, right? It would mean either we're running the kernel, but we're not with the privileges the kernel has, or it would mean we have a way as a user to directly change to get kernel privileges, to change in the supervisor mode. So getting in the kernel is a lot trickier than that. We're not going to be able to do it with just a regular function call. We're going to need to do other things. And the way we get there is first going through libc. This is just a regular library code. And what libc provides is a bunch of wrappers around functions that call into the kernel. Set UID call, this is what's in libc. So this thing changes it to have the, the double bars in front of it. And it's doing what's a macro that sets up the syscall to set UID. So this is all still user level code. This is libc that is linked to most C programs. It's just a wrapper. And what that syscall wrapper is doing, there's a, a lot of different macros. Eventually, what it's doing is this. Loading into the register the number that identifies this particular system call. So all the system calls have numbers. And there, there's only a, a bit over 100 of them. There's not a huge number of system calls. It's loading into this register the number that corresponds to the set UID system call. And then it's making the system call. And the way it makes the system call, which you can't quite see here because it's all hidden in macros, is doing an interrupt. And it's interrupt hex number 80. That's just the convention for how to make a system call. That's what you do to make a system call in Linux. We can't call into the kernel directly. In order to actually run inside the kernel in a useful way, the processor has to be in supervisor mode. Normal function calls can't change the mode of the processor. But to make a system call happen, we need to change the mode of the processor. To do something like set UID, we need supervisor privileges. We need to be running in the kernel. We can't do that directly. We need to be a supervisor. And a regular function call is never going to change our privileges. That's why we need to do this. So we started in Apache. We called this function that's defined in libc, which is just a wrapper around some assembly code, which eventually does this interrupt. And the interrupt is now causing an interrupt in the processor which is going to get handled by the kernel. And when it gets handled by the kernel, we're going to jump into supervisor mode and run some code in the kernel that does the actual set UID. Let's look more what's going on in here to make that happen. This is what CPUs look like 10 or 15 years ago. So we had a CPU. We have an interrupt controller. And interrupts come into the interrupt controller. You saw a few classes ago about the keyboard interrupt and how that's done in Iron Kernel. We're going to look at the x86 processor instead of the ARM today. What would be on the ARM is pretty similar to this, but it's easier, at least I have easier understanding of what's in the x86, and there are better pictures for it. So we're going to look at x86, but you can certainly find very similar things for ARM. Where is this interrupt that is making the system call coming from? So we said you know, the key press interrupt comes because someone physically pressed the key, and that caused some signal to go high, which eventually caused this interrupt. Where is the system call interrupt coming from? Yeah, right. So it was just an instruction. So we ran that instruction. We ran an instruction. This is just a regular instruction that runs in the CPU. We ran this instruction. And what happens when the CPU runs that instruction? Well, it's got a way to generate interrupts. And that interrupts going into the controller, which eventually is going to get back to the CPU. So these two are, are linked in both directions. Right? The CPU can do things that's going to generate an interrupt that is seen by the controller. So this was how PCs were designed until maybe 10, 20 years ago. How do you think things are different in the processor that you have today? So how many cores does the processor you have today have? Probably more than one, even in your phone. So you have probably at least two cores, maybe four, maybe, maybe more. How should this change if we have more cores? Do we still have one interrupt controller, or should we have more than one? OK, so we could have one per core, right? Each core could have its own. So if we have one interrupt controller per core, what happens when you press a key? OK, so you could send it to all of them. It would be hard for them to figure out which one handles it. Exactly, yeah. So what you really need 
you want one per core, and then you want one extra one. Right? You want one that handles all the interrupts that are special, all the interrupts that really come from the outside. I, actually, the timer is probably per core. But the keyboard, we don't know which core to send that to. So we need a super interrupt controller that handles things like keyboard interrupts. And then we want one per core, because when we do something like this, when we execute a system call, we would like that interrupt handled by the same core. So that's what modern PCs do. Instead of just one interrupt controller, we have each core has a local interrupt controller that handles things like system calls or local timers, things that are specific to that core. And then we have an external interrupt controller that handles external events. So things like key presses will go to that external one, which now can go to any of these cores, whereas the local ones are connected closely to one core. If you look closer, you can see there's lots of hardware to make that happen. There are connections between the CPU core, connections coming in from the CPU core, and connections going out to it. And then there's lots of, these are local things, right? We have a local timer. We have a thermal sensor. So there'll be an interrupt if the processor gets too hot. So some code can run to try to figure out how to make it get less hot. You want your scheduler to know about that, among other things. And then the external ones are going to come in separately. What happens when the interrupt comes in, so now the processor is getting an interrupt. It's got to know some code to jump to to handle that. So there's some table that keeps track of, for each interrupt that comes in, where do you go and what do you do? You saw in the iron kernel code, this code that was used to set up the keyboard interrupts, this is setting up that table. So there's some data structure that the processor will use when an interrupt comes in to figure out where to go. And these are just pointers to functions. These are just addresses that it's going to jump to. But the important thing is, because it's now handling an interrupt, it can set the mode to supervisor mode and jump to that code running with privileges. So that's what's going on. So we ran this instruction. So this set up the call number. This is just some number being stored in a register. And then we set up that interrupt. That goes to the interrupt controller. That's going to end up getting to supervisor mode and jumping to some instruction that will now handle that interrupt. And all the system calls are the same interrupt. How the OS figures out what to do in the handler is looking at this value. Looking at the value stored in that register tells you which system call to do. And there could be arguments also stored to give parameters to the call. This is what's happening. We're now doing a stack switch in response to the interrupt. Part of what's happening is the value in this register, which includes the privilege level, can now be set to supervisor mode. And now we can run code with the privileges of the kernel. So we've done our contact switch. In our web server, we called set UID. That went into libc. That didn't interrupt. Got to the processor. Processor interrupt table happened. Now we're in the kernel running in supervisor mode. What's the code in the kernel going to look like? In the kernel, we've set up this interrupt table. You saw it how the keyboard interrupts were set up in the iron kernel. The vector for system calls, this is just one of those entries in the table. This line here right, is setting up for this interrupt. Here's where we're going to go. We're going to go to this function that handles all the system calls. What do we expect the value of IA32 syscall vector is? We're setting up a line in this interrupt table that says if this interrupt comes in, the IA32 syscall vector, we're going to jump to this code. And that's the code that handles all the system calls. So that should match the interrupt that is a system call. And if we search the code, we should be very happy to see that it does. This is interrupt 80, which by convention, or by how Linux is implemented, is the one to do system calls. But there's nothing special about interrupt 80. If you want to add system calls to Iron Kernel, you could pick some other interrupt number that's not used for anything else and make that your system call interrupt. Or you could do something different and have multiple system call interrupts for different kinds of system calls. But this is what Linux does. So we've got the interrupt. This code is in assembly, so we're not going to look at it. But there's some code that handles that interrupt and is going to look at the value in this register, in RAX. It's going to look at the value there to figure out which system call to do. And the system call it's going to do in this case is set UID. And this is defined in the kernel sys.c code. Right, this is a macro that is just giving us the right type header and some other things to make it a definition of a system call. So this starts to look fairly like regular code. Well, I guess all of this regular code, right? but this is just code now that is inside the kernel. So it's running with supervisor mode. And it's what gets called when the system call happens because of the interrupt. Here's what it's doing. So we're creating 
some struct to store the credentials. Does that make sense? So we're calling some function to prepare the credentials, and if it returns null, that's what the not new is, right? So if the value of new is zero, we're returning this funny value. Can anyone make sense of what that is? You're at least doing some things in problems that forward the memory allocator. So what can go wrong when we prepare the credentials? Yeah, so we could run out of memory, right? And that's what this error is. If we're not able to, so there's no permission checking going on here. There's nothing else. We just ran out of memory. And if that set UID call, you wouldn't think set UID is something that could run out of memory, but it can't, right? It can fail because you ran out of memory in the kernel. And then the rest of this is the more interesting stuff, right? So this is the error that you don't have permission. And it's setting it to this. This is not like the Apache code that is written to be easy to understand and be confident that it's correct. This Linux kernel code is much harder to read and not really for good reasons. Right? So it's setting the return value to the error. This isn't the end. It's going to change that to something else if it succeeds. So it's pretty confusing to say we're going to assume that it's going to give the permissions error until we do something else. And then we do all the other things to actually try to set it. So these are all basically creating this new object, which is our credential struct. Then we're calling commit credentials to change them. And there's some checking going on before that to know that it's OK. And then in commit credentials, this is where we actually change the credentials. So what do you expect to happen? So when we're doing a set UID, at a high level, what should happen somewhere? So where, where do you think the UID is stored? Is this like the, the supervisor bit or something else? When we do a system call, we've got to have this interrupt. So we go through the kernel so we can change the IO privilege level to be supervisor. So the kernel can do things user level programs cannot. Do we think set UID is doing something like that? Is it changing something special in the processor? Or is it doing something more like regular code? Good. So you're definitely on the right track. So it, it, it is changing some value that's part of a data structure. This is not some special bit stored in some special register, like supervisor mode. But this is something the kernel has implemented, some way to keep track for each process what its user ID is. This value new, right? so you, we saw that we're passing in this struct. Right? This is just some data structure. As part of every task, every process that's running, the kernel's keeping track of what its user ID is. Now, that certainly has to be some part of memory that only the kernel can change. Right? If the user level process could change the user ID associated with its process, well, then it could do effectively a set UID without going through the kernel. Right? It could change that value to be 0 and start to be root. So it better be in some memory that is not visible to the user, but it's just some data structure in memory that stores the user ID. And if we look at this code, we can see that. So here's what's happening. So we stored in new. So this, inside the new struct, we stored the new ID. That's what we're setting UID to. We call it commit credentials passing new in. And then in commit credentials, this is really what's going on. So we have task, which is current. So current is some global variable that is the current task. So that's the data structure that OS is using to keep track of information about the current task. That's the one that called set UID. And what this, I, actually, so there, there are two. Right? Within the task, there's some field that stores its credentials. And we're assigning new to that field. And new is this new struct that has within it the UID that we're doing the set UID to. So this is just changing the value in some data structure. Nothing magic going on. Does that all make sense? So there are a lot of steps, right? Set UID seems like a pretty simple system call. All we're doing is changing really one value stored in one data structure. But in order to do that, because it's something protected by the kernel, well, we've got to go through this interrupt. Right? So what happened? We called set UID. It went to libc. We had this interrupt. We got to our interrupt table, jumped to the CPU, set to supervisor mode, jumped into the kernel, ran that code. What happens after that? Do we return like a normal function call? How do we get back to Apache? If you remember all that code that we looked at in the SU exec, all of those tests that we were doing before it would do the exec v, well, that was all after this hit UID call. It just looks like a regular function call in the Apache code. So how do we get back? Do we just return? How far are we going to get by just returning? Is there a call stack to return to get back to Apache? So we can't just return back. Because we've got to actually jump back to user mode. So we're going to do a contact switch. 
This is similar to what the scheduler does. Every time the scheduler switches which process is running, right, the scheduler has to know which process is running to set up the register, to set up the processor in the right way, and then jump to the right instruction to run. And in this case, we've got to jump to the instruction there. We need to know what that is. And I think we know it is. it's not anything special with the interrupt controller. It's basically, well, that was what the program counter was at the time the interrupt happened. So that's still visible to that, that core hasn't done anything else, because until the operating system runs something else on that core, that is still the program counter, I believe. Actually, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure, sure how it's stored. But somewhere that program counter has to be stored. When we return from the syscall, and it's actually going to return, not directly to here, it's going to return through libc, and libc does some things to clean up after the syscall, and then it does a normal return to get back to the code in Apache. And then we go on running just like normal. We're back in user space. Everything's set up just the way it was before that call. As a user writing a user level program, you don't have to know anything special about what's going on inside the kernel unless you want to understand what's happening. Maybe what someone should do for their project is make system calls work in iron kernel. Does this make sense? Would it make sense to start adding system calls to iron kernel? Until you have user level programs, you don't need system calls. Before we get to having system calls in Iron Kernel, we've got to have some way to run a user level process. As long as everything's running inside the kernel, everything's a regular call. We don't need system calls. But for it to be a useful OS that can run programs, well, we need to be able to run a program at user level. And then we need system calls. So those two things are, are really very closely intertwined. If you support user level programs without system calls, you can have user level programs that they can't actually do anything. They can't print on the screen, they can't write the files, they can't do anything. So you sort of have to do both of these at once. So this is a pretty big project. Maybe you need like two teams to do that. But definitely something that would be necessary to make this a commodity operating system. On the other hand, you could decide, well, we really want to run our web server in the kernel. By all accounts, not a good idea. But you could get Zeta running inside our kernel without supporting user level programs by running it inside the kernel. And it probably would perform really well if you did that. We've had our little journey through the kernel. And I hope that you will admire and emulate the Apache SU exec code, not the Linux kernel code. <laughs> <laughs>